I'm John Hepburn, CEO and Scientific Director of MyTax. All right, so what are the main forces currently shaping the future of work and skills development? We're seeing in this time of pandemic a lot of the forces uh, playing out in a very accelerated fashion uh, because of remote work um, and the reliance on digital infrastructure. But these forces have been in play for a long, long time. Uh, the traditional economy, uh, manufacturing and resource-based, is becoming less important. And what some people call the knowledge economy, uh, an economy based on intangible uh, assets and infrastructure, is becoming more important. Uh, jobs are shifting into the service economy, into an economy that requires uh, more education, uh, comfort with uh, so-called uh, digital natives. Um, basically, uh, an economy that relies more on ideas than on manufacture. Uh, globalization has played a role in this as manufacturing jobs shift overseas to uh, lower wage markets. And so working on design, on creativity, on jobs that really require a higher level of performance and much more versatility uh, are becoming more and more important. Mm, very interesting. And, and that connection with the pandemic is, of course, very, uh, yeah, yeah, very, uh, it, it's kind of all encompassing. It, it touches everything. And some people would say it accelerates some of those mega trends. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I think that, um, well, of course, there's the oft repeated uh, adage that working remotely was not really working uh, prior to the pandemic. And so it was a special privilege to be allowed to work from home. And there was always a suspicion that, well, maybe you weren't really working. With the pandemic, everybody's had to work from home if it was possible. And we know a lot of people, millions and millions in Canada, have lost jobs because they couldn't work remotely, especially in uh, the tourism industry and a lot of sectors of the service industry. But we've seen that, in fact, people can work from home. They can work remotely. Uh, productivity has not declined in areas where remote work is possible. And so this has changed thinking on what the nature of work is going to be going into the future. Are people going to go back to offices um, or are they going to continue working from home? What does an office mean and what is the nature of, of work? So a simple question, who needs to do what? In other words, who are the main stakeholders that need to improve, that need to support, that need to perhaps guide uh, us, our businesses, our entrepreneurs, our, our, our innovators, our researchers, um, through this transition? Clearly, the educational system has to adapt. Um, there's a great emphasis on discipline-based uh, credentialing, for lack of a better word. Um, universities, of course, are very good at um, training people in technical skills. Uh, computer science departments train people to be computer scientists. Uh, mechanical engineering departments train people to be mechanical engineers. They're good at that. However, the new economy and the new jobs that we're seeing require skills that go beyond just strictly technical skills. And so universities have to adapt to accept this um, with better work integrated learning. Governments need to support innovation where governments tend to support more traditional industries and not support innovation quite as well. So governments need to support innovation. Industry needs to step up. Um, industry needs to partner with educational institutions to make work integrated learning possible. And also industry hires people often based on credentials and then expresses frustration that people don't have the sort of professional skills that they need. So industry needs to, you know, be a bit more involved in the training and providing their workforce with the skills that are needed. Um, and industry can be flexible. And again, getting back to the pandemic, we've seen this. Um, things that were not viewed as being possible before the pandemic are now absolutely possible. So if industry could continue in this vein and support the sort of uh, versatility of, of training that, that, that their workers need. And finally, I think Canada, we have a problem with productivity and innovation in industry. Industry needs to step up and be more innovative and government needs to support that. And then of course the skilled, the appropriately skilled workforce needs to be part of that transition. 
So we talk a lot about skills when we talk about the future of work. We talk about reskilling. We talk about retooling. We talk about soft skills. We talk about hard skills. Um, what are we talking about here exactly? What are the skills, broadly speaking, that our workforce will need to be competitive and innovative in the future economy? Well, it's it, yeah. There's there's a language of hard skills and soft skills, which which I actually don't like because it implies that you know soft skills are sort of fluffy and you know they're not they're not so necessary and not nearly as important as credentials, uh, i.e., hard skills. I mean, credentials are necessary uh, if somebody is going to be doing um, machine learning coding and and developing you know data analysis methodologies or if they're going to become doctors or engineers obviously they need technical training and that's that will continue but they also need what i would rather call professional skills rather than soft skills people need to be versatile they need to be creative um, they need to understand the importance of communication uh, it doesn't do you any good to have great ideas if you can't communicate them They need to, to know how to work in teams, um, and we're seeing this with remote, with remote work. Uh, making connections with your coworkers becomes even more important uh, when you're seeing people on Zoom screens and things like that. Um, writing skills. Uh, as referred to digital natives earlier, you need to be very comfortable in a, what is increasingly a digital infrastructure-based economy. Um, versatility. So all of these things are very important. So I think all of those things are going to become part of creating the new workforce. Do you think that we need to start thinking differently about education, about skills, about, about what, you know, what a career means? And do you think we need to think more about the, the complementarity between various skills? I mean, I, I know, for instance, that many uh, of the world's greatest thinkers uh, actually have, have excelled in multiple fields. And if I think if I, if I remember your biography, you, you, it includes you. <laughs> um, I think that one of the problems with with the way we educate people is the assumption is we have to cram all the knowledge in about their technical skills. And then when they leave the university, they're not going to learn anymore. And that's, of course, completely incorrect. We have to continue learning throughout life and companies have to allow for that. Society has to allow for that. Uh, the assumption that all of the stuff that you learned as an undergraduate is still going to be valid, except for the core skills. Things like mathematics don't change. The laws of physics don't change. Um, so core skills are going to remain the same, but the sort of the details of technical training are going to change and people have to adapt to that. How do you see education having to adapt over the coming years? What changes do you see being needed to those institutions and, and others? First of all, a knowledge of what it is you can and cannot do. So increased openness to collaboration. So, And we've seen this with universities collaborating with, with technical colleges um, in, in their programs. In other words, admitting that there are some things that maybe colleges do better. Um, work integrated learning is another example. Um, if you consider a classic uh, PhD program, so very, very advanced education The people who are engaged in training the PhD students are professors who probably have never worked outside of a university setting. And so the vast majority of their students are going to go on and work in a non-university setting. And so recognizing that fact that you can train them as a professor in the technical discipline-based skills and, and research methodology and all of those good things that I would classify as fundamental skills, but you don't really know how industry operates or how government operates. And so admitting that, first of all, and then seeking collaborations to, to fill in the gaps so students get a, a better, um, more rounded education. Industry, of course, complains that students don't arrive fully fledged. You know, they hire people based on credentials. And then, as I said earlier, complain that they don't have the professional skills that industry wants them to have. Well, is it the job of a university to give all of the professional skills that a student needs to adapt to the reality of the workforce when the people providing those skills don't know exactly what is needed? 
in government industry, not-for-profits, things that are non-academic institutions. And so again, a collaboration. Industry needs to do its part in terms of doing the training that's necessary, providing the skills that are necessary, um, hiring based on skills rather than credentials, uh, things like that. So I think in general, collaboration and openness to the things that you can't do is what's necessary on all sides. How can these skills best be developed and fostered? I'm, I'm, fostered. I'm thinking about MyTac's uh, cooperative innovation model, work integrated learning, etc. Where do students and workers go to either learn or to update their skills, given what we've talked about between the interplay that's needed uh, between uh, academic, the academic world and the professional or the, or the real world? Well, so for the for the students, if I focus on that, which which my tax currently does, then the answer is obvious. I mean, students need to incorporate uh, stages outside of the of the university into their training. Uh, they need to spend time away from the university, away from university laboratories, uh, in an industry setting and or a not for profit setting, working with community groups. I mean, just something that is not the sort of pure academic training that, that most students focus their attention on and, and recognize that that's actually adding to their university training. It's not instead of, but it's, it's incorporated into. Um, the reverse direction where people are out working in industry already and they have paid jobs, really that's, that's something I think we need to work harder at and, and we're not doing it very well. So industry needs to be willing to allow people to step away from whatever they're doing to seek training. And, you know, we see this at management level with people being allowed to do executive MBAs and things like that. But, but I would see it on a more general level where, where people are, they retain their connection with the company. They continue getting paid perhaps, you know, in partnership with an organization like MyTax or an equivalent organization. And they do something that's different. To, to improve their skills, uh, part of lifelong learning. I think that needs to be emphasized throughout, uh, throughout a career. You know, lifelong learning can go on as long as somebody is in the workforce and, and of course, beyond, but uh, particularly when they're in the workforce. Is that sort of the role my tax plays? I mean, to try to help connect the research, the R&D, the, the, the academic uh, output with the real world, let's say, of business, of trying to find solutions, of commercializing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my tax, my tax role is partnership creation. I mean, you know, everything we do is based on, on training, in a sense, in that students are involved and postdoctoral fellows doing internships. Um, but really, the core of my tax is to identify problems in a non-academic setting, so industry, for example, and then seek um, help from an academic institution, from the professors and students in a university who can work together with industry in a true partnership to solve the problem. And the people doing the work are going to be the students and the postdoctoral fellows. And so it's, it's different from work integrated learning, where, which, is, which is valuable no matter what no matter what type of work integrated learning it is. But in a standard co-op job placement, the student leaves the university behind and goes and works in industry. And that's great for the student because they learn, you know, life in the, in the real world, uh, in, in air quotes. But it doesn't help the university. The university doesn't, the student doesn't transmit that knowledge except in an indirect way back to the university. And so I think my tax model of partnership creation and, and solving problems by using university talent and coupling it with industry need has an impact both on industry and on the university. It creates a bridge that hopefully will last beyond the particular student internship. So uh, you obviously have um, a ton of uh, expertise, experience building those partnerships. Uh, what do they look like? In other words, what sort of partnerships and collaborations are and will be necessary so that we can best implement these kind of skill development programs that we're talking about? First of all, the secret is to, rather than the traditional um, method of technology transfer where ideas get generated in a university or a post-secondary institution, 
and then basically get sold outside the institution. And that, that can work very well. Um, we reverse that at MyTax, where our business development people talk to non-academics, uh, to industry, to not-for-profits, and try and understand what their problem is. And, you know, they're very skilled people who are highly trained themselves, the business development people. And so once they have a good understanding of what the issue is, um, then they seek partners from academia who, who are willing and able to work on the problem. The bigger the problem, the more people they need. Uh, the more students, the more professors, they may need a multidisciplinary approach. And so you tailor the, the partnership based on the problem. We've been doing a lot of work recently with, with COVID-19. And so yeah. an example of actually a problem that was solved that the company didn't know that they were capable of solving was based on a partnership we had with a company that manufactures a company in Ontario that manufactures sort of power modules. I mean, these are things in shipping containers um, for remote communities, for sustainable energy, so that you could, you know, bring these things in, plug them in, and they were ready to go to become part of a local electricity grid. Uh, the PhD student who was working with this company on this specific project, which, which was the originally defined partnership, recognized that the same his expertise could be used to build portable clinics. You know, you could use these same shipping containers. You obviously do a different manufacturing process, but you'd put in the necessary HVAC and power and, you know, basically have these things as completely autonomous uh, clinics. And so that was an example of a smart student working with an existing partnership um, between his university and a company to solve a problem that the company didn't didn't really set out to solve. Uh, one that would be more relevant, a uh, partnership that was constructed, would be a partnership where a company was working on technology to test wastewater for nasty chemicals, let's say. And of course, you've heard a lot of talk about um, wastewater being tested for COVID-19. Well, they recognize that we can do the same thing. Um, and so a partnership got created uh, based on the existing partnership to do exactly that. Other examples are, you know, more traditional, working with companies on 5G technology, um, working between the university expertise and the companies. And so basically the problems that we like to work on are problems that have potentially a research-based solution. You know, they take full advantage of the knowledge that's available in the universities to create a new technology or to innovate the, an existing process to adapt an existing process. That's that's the sort of problem that we work on. And we do thousands of these every year. So final question. Um, you have 30 seconds to pitch a person or even a group uh, in a position of power. So that's very broad. I mean, that, but you have to choose one. So it could be the prime minister, it could be industry leaders, it could be academic leaders, it could be students, it could be professionals, it could be professionals or, or it could be Canadians at large. Um, who would you choose to pitch in 30 seconds to prepare Canada's workforce for the future of work? What would you say, what would you urge this person or this group to do in 30 seconds? I would say the pitch to the federal government is the innovation economy is based on talent and the talent that we need has training beyond the university training. They have training that's, that's beyond traditional work integrated learning. They have training that's a partnership uh, at all levels, partnership between the universities and industry, between industry and government. And MyTax is perfectly positioned as an independent organization To create these partnerships, we have a proven track record of partnership creation to support the training of the next generation of skilled workers for the innovation economy.